Five, in three, two, one. Cover a couple of different things. Later on, Sean will be covering how to build us a party button. Ah, yes, the party button. What we have here is one certified party button. As you can see, I'll be showing how to build this a little bit later. Um, it consists of one of SparkFun's giant blue buttons. That's just going to trigger an Arduino to play a song on an SD card using SparkFun's MP3 shield. Um, that actually sounds one of our car horns, and then once that's done, it plays the song through an amplifier and a speaker out the front here. Um, just to make sure, if you guys are going to be following along, make sure you've got some tools ready. Uh, you need a soldering iron, some solder, helping hands, those are always good, some wire cutters, wire strippers, needle nose pliers, um, some scissors, an X-Acto knife, something to cut with, a hot glue gun, hot glue, and something to mark with, such as a Sharpie or a pen. Um, the wish list for all the parts for this should be down below in the comments or on SparkFun's main site. Uh, don't forget you're going to need a USB cable to program the Arduino, um, and now's a good time to charge your battery. So if you have one of these RC batteries, these lithium polymers sitting around, uh, go ahead and start charging that with a uh, balanced LiPo charger. Um, but before that, I think, Evan, you want to show us something. Thanks, Sean. So, while Sean's getting ready, and while you guys are getting ready to get all of your parts for this build, uh, I, found, I came across this handy little miniature quadcopter. Now, these quadcopters have been become fairly prolific lately, and today I'm going to murder one of these and tear it apart while you watch in one of our SparkFun Live teardowns. So, multi-rotor multi copters, usually quadcopters, have been in the news a lot lately. Uh, they started out fairly recently in the last couple of years, just showing up on the market, but now they've been evaluated by certain companies such as Amazon for their home delivery service. Um, so this is a fairly prolific thing, and actually some of these uh, are so, so widely available that you can actually get something such as this for about $50 at your local ho uh, hobby store or hardware store. So I'm going to cover a couple of brief points on quad rotor anatomy. So the first thing to do when we tear into one of these guys is uh, we want to remove the biting organ or the, the blades. So that way, because the power is still attached, if it should decide randomly that it wanted to engage these motors will spin and not take my fingers off. Now these are fairly small and low powered motors so it's not actually a risk to lose a finger with something like this but a larger quad rotor can definitely cause some serious damage. Now before I get into the shroud I'll show you a couple of the basic organs on the bottom side of the board. Now you can see your four major motors that's that is the crux of the quadcopter. That's going to provide the lifting force. Um, now, typically motors will draw, a lot of, uh, will draw more current than a microcontroller is going to want to provide naturally. So it's good to have some kind of switching circuit, such as a transistor, to handle the loads of the motor as an intermediary between the motor and the, and the controller. The shroud is just maintained on board by a couple of little clips that are very easy to remove. All you need to do is basically slip a fingernail or a screwdriver under these clips and carefully remove them so as not to break them. Now under the shroud you'll be able to find a lithium polymer battery which is actually very similar to ours uh, with the foil packs and the yellow tops. Um, this is a, a standard 3.7 volt LiPo battery um, which does have its own onboard circuit protection, as you can see, or maybe even be able to see inside the Kapton tape. Now, 
This is a good practice when taking apart any piece of electronic or mechatronic device is to remove the power source completely before continuing. So that leaves us with the motor mounts and the bare board. Now the board is populated with a two side configuration. The bottom side which we covered has the, the power, the, the regulating transistors as well as the crystal for maintaining time and the on off switch. On the top side of the board, underneath the lithium polymer battery, you'll find some number of ICs. Now on this one we have four visible, the largest one being most likely the microcontroller which handles most of, which, which will handle the input. Additionally we have what is likely a transmitter radio circuit so it can communicate with the controller. And because the controller is fairly discreet, up, down, left, right, and trim, um, a lot of the onboard processing and onboard sensing is regulated by a gyroscope. So all you have to do is send it a command, and it will, the machine will parse what commands have to happen to keep the rotors stabilized. Now beyond that, all we have is the motors in their mounts, and that can slip through fairly easily or somewhat easily into these into the holes in the board. And at times like this, I like to have my uh, handy SparkFun uh, warranty voider to force things through the clips. Side one goes through, and I said force. Now you don't. You want to be careful not to actually force things through because you could very easily cause damage to your system, especially a system such as this, where the PCB has been populated fairly sparsely and then de uh, designed to cut out excess weight so as to ensure maximum flight time. So there you have it, the basic anatomy of a quad rotor copter as it is broken down. Now all that leaves is the controller. Now this one likes a little bit more of a precise screwdriver for the battery compartment. So if you need a better, t uh, a better bit, you can use our multi-tool kit to get the right size bit for your screwdriver. Um, while Evan's doing this, I just want to make a point. If you guys are watching there, you have the comments on, I believe, the right side of YouTube, feel free to ask your questions. Um, Mike, I know, is going to be in the chat room to answer any of your questions. If anything is directed at either me or Evan, they'll be passing the card to us, and we will answer them as uh, we can. Thank you, Sean. Sure. So now that I've got the batteries out and the battery compartment off, getting into the controller compartment is as simple as removing two screws, and it might need a little bit of extra help from the slot end of the screwdriver because these things tend to be fairly well put together and can need a little bit of extra coaxing. Now, again, don't force it. If it doesn't come right off, probably need to loosen another screw. This particular model only has two available on the outside. And then as we get into it, you'll find that the PCB has been held down by another two screws inside. So I'll switch back to my Phillips side screwdriver and get the board off here. Now, if I was really clever, and I'm usually not, I would have removed the power switch on the outside first because this is actually force fit onto the, power, onto the actual electronic component, so that's actually holding the board in place. With that out of the way, I can simply remove the PCB from the housing. Beware of little buttons. They might try to scatter off and uh, make it hard to reassemble your board. So once we're inside the board, you can see a number of controls as well as two analog joysticks. Now the analog joysticks are similar in structure to our own analog joysticks, 
with the two axis potentiometers as well as in this case an unused push button switch. Now it's, it's good to note that on the drive side the actual throttle is not spring loaded so it trims like a uh, typical aircraft control. And these will just slide off revealing the two axis potentiometers on each side. Also as you'll be able to see you'll find a pair of trim buttons here and a pair of trim buttons here that correspond to those on the outside control. So all that, all that remains is the radio transmitter circuit, the crystal, and the processor. And here's Sean with the build. So before I do that, you want to fly it real quick? Absolutely. Take it for a spin. We got another one up here so you can actually see it in action. Oh, is it not going? Yeah, it is see. not going. Here, you try it. That is a failure. Give me one second, because I do want to see this thing fly. I'm sure everybody else does too. Um, these are actually pretty sweet. Now, like I said, these are available for about 50 bucks from your local hobby or hardware store. So be sure to pick yours up and play with it, break it, take it apart. Do whatever. All right. So here's Sean with the uh, build of the party button. Cool. Thanks, Evan. Um, so we want to get started here. So the first thing we want to do is attach up the big blue button. A um, couple things I want to point out here is we have um, some circuits that we want to take a look at. Um, so in the, in the big button themselves, we actually have a built-in LED. Um, and if we could get a shot of the circuit, the circuit card down here from the above. Um, as you can see here, we're going to hook up the microcontroller um, to a resistor and LED circuit. Keep in mind that both of these are built into the big button. And we're just going to configure an output pin or a pin as an output from the Arduino to drive current through the LED. And that's just going to turn on the LED for us. Uh, the other thing that we want to have, or the other thing that's part of this, is a button circuit. Um, and that's going to actually be the big button itself. So notice that the circuit is broken. Once, as long as the button is not pressed. And what that means is we're going to connect the button to ground and to an input pin of the Arduino. So when is the button is, as long as the button is up, as in you're not pressing it, the circuit is broken and it would be just floating. But we're going to add in a pull-up resistor so that when the button is up, what that does is pull everything to 5 volts or high in this case. So on the input, when it is high, the button is up. When you push the button, that actually connects the circuit down here and connects the pin to ground. So button up is high, button down is low or ground. And if we combine those, we get what's actually in on the big button. And that is just going to be a combination of our LED and uh, resistor circuit along with the pull-up. We're going to connect the COM or common to ground and we're going to connect that to the LED minus. Um, we're going to connect what's normally open to the big button to the uh, pull up on, I'm sorry, to the input pin on the Arduino. Um, notice that we have an internal pull up enabled and we're just going to do that through code. Um, that saves us from actually having to do a bunch of soldering and adding extra components to this. So that'll be helpful. The Arduino has that built in for us. So we're going to get started with this. Let me show you what we're doing with the big button here. Um, so here's our button. Um, this is a good time to take a look at the button and notice that I've gone ahead and marked the plus and minus, and that is the two outer pins, which are LED. Um, you can hook that up to 5 volts and switch them to see what lights the big button because there is an, there is an LED on the inside. Um, we also have the top pieces are common. Going down the sides, we have the normally open and normally closed. We're not going to be using the normally closed pin. So what we're going to do first is we need to hook up the um, minus to the common, and we're going to do that by using some uh, wires, and I'm using solid core wires here. You're welcome to use uh, stranded core or stranded wires, um, but you would have to tin them. This is just going to save us some time uh, because we are going to ultimately be connecting these to the Arduino using jumper wires, and this just saves us a good bit of time and um, wiring stuff up. So I'm going to go ahead and start wiring this, and what we want to do for these is we want to actually bend little hooks into the wires there. Um, I'm going to use the helping hands and we're going to loop the hook 
through the pin, and I'm going to use the helping hand to hold it like so. Um, it's always a good idea to crimp these into place and then solder that up. So while I'm soldering this up, Evan, do you have anything to tell us about the world of technology news? Absolutely, Sean. Thank you. So the International Consumer Electronics Show begins tomorrow in Las Vegas, Nevada. The four-day show plays host to some of the latest and greatest in consumer technology from around the world. Now, last year we found that there was a huge influx of 3D printers and associated technology. This year we're expecting to see a huge push for 4K displays and technology as well as associated content. As always, we can expect to see all of the coolest toys bef well before anyone else sees them. And we actually have a contingent of our engineering team out there on site right now. So if you're out there in Las Vegas and you happen to see some of our team, be sure to stop by and or stop them and say hi. John? All right, thanks, Evan. Um, I'm just going to so be soldering some of these components on. Um, this one I'm going to need to just tack on briefly. I'm just going to wet some solder onto that. Um, we're going to come back to that one because that one actually also needs to be connected to the ground pin of the Arduino. Um, but first, to actually hold this into place, I'm going to make another loop in this one, and I'm going to connect that to my common. As you can see here, as soon as I can get that through. There we are. Um, and like I mentioned, you always want to try to cinch these hooks down. Um, that just makes soldering a lot easier for everyone. Move my helping hands out of the way. And what I want to do is rest my soldering iron across both the wire and the pin to allow it to heat both of the metals. Um, you'll notice that the solder starts flowing by itself once it touches the metal, and I'm not applying the solder to the soldering iron. Of course, this would help if it was a little bit more stable. There we are. And you can see it solidify once it turns that kind of dullish color. Um, that's usually a rosin, or not a rosin, or a flux that's being solidified um, and crystallized, so you can just wash that off if you're trying to do any sort of reliability here. Um, so the next thing I want to do is add another hook. I'm going to go to the minus side of my LED again using my helping hands. And I'm going to get this around at a very awkward angle. Here we go. Um, and because I hit, did the hooks, even if the solder melts while I'm doing this on the other one, it should mostly stay in place. So we have that one. Now we want to check. Yep, those are still in place. So we want to add another hook, always with the hooks, to the plus side of the LED. And we're just once again going to try to get, and you want to use not the very tip of the soldering iron. You want to use a little bit back from the tip uh, because what that does is transfers the maximum amount of heat to whichever surface you might be trying to solder to. Um, another trick I like to do is put a little bit of solder on the tip. That seems to, oh dear, that didn't work so well. Um, this thing fell open, so let's put the hook back in there. Guess what I forgot to do? You want to cinch these down so they don't move like they just did while we were trying to solder. And we were having some instant mic adjustments while I'm soldering. Always a dangerous proposition. And we are going to solder. Come on. There it goes. All right, so once that's solidified, and check that connection, make sure that's mostly good. Yeah, that'll work for our purposes. So, and we're going to add one more to the normally open. Um, always with the cinching. Let's not cinch the two pins together. Hold those down, and we're going to want to solder this into place. Uh, 
Um, and anytime you're doing a very large surface like these pins, um, that usually requires a very long dwell time with your soldering iron before you can get any of the solder to melt. So these you just have to be patient with. And as always, feel free to leave a comment with your question on our page for the broadcast. Okay, so we've got the button here, we've got the wires, we have the minus LED hooked up to the common, we've got a minus that's going to go to ground on our Arduino, we've got a plus going to our output pin, and we have a normally open that is going to an input pin on the Arduino. Um, so, next up we want to do the car horn. And this one is a little bit tricky. Um, so if we can get another shot of this circuitry, or this uh, circuit, that this diagram we have going on. Um, the car horn is rated for 12 volts and will easily suck 8 amps. That is far more than the Arduino can provide. So we're going to use a very large MOSFET, an N-channel MOSFET. Um, these things are rated for about 60 amps, so it's perfectly fine. Um, what I've noticed is that the batteries, uh, these here, the RC batteries that SparkFun sells. And the, these that we SparkFun sells are rated for 7.4 volts. Um, what that means is that they will provide that even though it is less than the rated 12 volts for the horn, it still seems to work. Uh, the problem I see sometimes is that when we have this all hooked up, the car horn will still happily try to draw a lot of amps and could potentially bring the voltage down. Um, of the whole Arduino circuit, which means that we may see a reset, so it might or might not work, but this is a good opportunity uh, to test this. All right. So, notice that we're using the MOSFET here. Um, we are going to be using, hooking up the output of the Arduino to the gate, which is going to be driving the switch, uh, controlling the current from the car horn. We're going to be using a pull down so that the floating line isn't just going every, anywhere. And all of that's going to be connected to ground so current just flows through. OK, let's begin to hook this up. So first thing I'm going to do is use one of these male Dean connectors. And that is going to be hooked up to the battery. You notice the batteries that we sell come with these. And they will mate like this. And they are polarized so that these horizontal pins are the plus and the vertical pins are your minus, or ground in this case. Um, so I'm going to be attaching two wires to each of these and just using the hooks like we did the last time. Um, one set is going to be going to the Arduino to s provide power. The other set is going to be going to the car horn to provide lots of current. So while I'm se setting that up, um, Evan, any more stories for us? Well, sure. While we're addressing uh, car on automotive uh, related hardware, IHS Automotive has recently produced a study forecasting the market saturation for autonomous, self-driving, and driverless vehicles over the next 36 years. The study goes on to predict, or the study predicts that consumer autonomous vehicles should be road ready by the year 2020. The study goes on to expect that about approximately 230,000 vehicles will be available and on the road by the year 2025, and by 2035, 11.8 vehicles will be road ready and on the road. Now, the study goes on to estimate that almost all driver, almost all vehicles on the road at that point will be uh, autonomous by the year 2050. So that being said, uh, there's still expected to be some amount of driver to driverless vehicle accidents so you better get your car horns ready. Speaking of which, Sean, how's your car horn? Oh, the car horn's not quite hooked up yet, Evan. Uh, we're still working on this power connector right here. Let me see. I'm trying to connect these down here. So they say, good. Um, it's always tricky when you're trying to do two wires on one terminal. Um, what I have done here is I've hooked up uh, both wires. I've used hooks on them and then sent them both through the uh, helping hand so that it'll hold both wires in place while I attempt to solder all of them at once. Um, this is preferable to trying to solder one at a time. If you try to solder one at a time, uh, you do the first one, that one might be okay. Uh, when you try to do the second one, it will likely desolder the first one and that just flies all over the place. Um, and this is also, once again, a very large connector, so it requires a good bit of dwell time with your iron tip. And we're getting that there, and it usually heats both sides, so I can come back in here and apply solder to both sides. 
So when the helping hand is actually holding the wire in place, that will help with a lot of the strain relief while the wire is in a liquid state. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Evan. Um, like Evan mentioned, because I'm going to be sitting here and letting it cool, um, it's so hot the solder is still in a liquid state. So like Evan said, the helping hands are going to be holding it there while the solder is solidifying. If you attempt to move it, you can end up with disturbed or bad solder joints. And I'm going to be doing the same exact thing to this other side. Ooh, those get hot. We're just going to set those up and do our two hooks again. Like so. And we've got the two hooks going in the side here. This one's a little bit easier on the horizontal one. Oh, actually, I don't want to come out that side because there's a chance I'm going to be shorting those two pins. I want to go to the outside of this Dean's connector. Um, and these connectors are quite useful. You find them a lot on um, RC type stuff. So your uh, cars, your RC cars, your RC planes, these appear a lot on the battery. They're nice because they're polarized. Um, and usually you'll find the female connector um, on the battery so you can't accidentally short pins together. These are not holding for me very nicely. So while Sean is uh, getting those final adjustments in order, let's uh, see what this thing can do in action. We just showed some footage of uh, the party button in action. Um, once we had that built up, we were able to go around last week and show it shooting some people in the office and uh, scaring them or getting them to party depending on their reaction to either the car horn or the music. And I'm just finishing up this connection here. There we go. All right, now I have everything all soldered into place. So this was definitely one of the trickier ones to do, and that one gets a little bit hot. Um, so then while that one's cooling, I want to pull out the end channel MOSFET for everyone to see. My little bag of parts here. Um, and what we're going to do with this is the way to remember these, these things go is you can read across the side gate drain source, so GDS. We're going to want to add a pull down between the gate and the source. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to make two little loops in our 10K resistor here, um, somewhat near the body of the resistor. And we want full loops on these because we're going to actually attach this to the MOSFET itself. Those might be a little tight, but this is going to take some adjusting. So I made that one a little bit too small, so we're just going to make this one a little bit bigger. And I'm just using a set of needle nose pliers here to adjust these and to make the loops. In fact, if you have to, remake the loop again and sometimes you can use the needle nose pliers themselves and wrap it around that way rather than trying to form it by eyeballing it. There we go. All right, so I'm just adding a pull down to this and I'm going to cinch these shut. And I'm going to use my helping hands. This thing should be nice and cool by now. Move this back. 
attach my MOSFET to the helping hands. And we are going to carefully solder those connections in there. And once again, make sure you're hitting the tip of the si iron against both the both sets of pins. It might take a little bit because there's still a good bit of metal that we have to heat up. There we go. That's one. Letting that rest and get all the heat flow and you'll see the heat flow and then the solder flows next to it. So we've made those connections, so now we've added our pull down. And this might be a little warm. Um, while that's cooling, we want to take a set of cutters and we want to trim our leads from the resistor. There we go. So we've added a pull down here. Now we want to make sure that we have not touched any metal um, from the resistor or any of our solder joints to the middle pin. Uh, that would be our drain. That would short some stuff out and we certainly don't want to do that. So then, now that we have our power Dean's connector, we're going to want to hook everything up to the horn. Um, and that's going to take a few more cables. And what we're going to do here is we want to take this connector and we want to make sure what is plus on this. And this might be a good time to figure out and mark what is plus. So we know that if we touch, put these in that, we know that the horizontal one lines up with the red wire here. And that's going to be our positive. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that. This is our positive. That way I don't forget and wire something backwards. Would not want that. So I know that that plus is going to go directly into the one of the inputs of our car horn here. Let's say this one. Use a little hook. Helping hands, as always. Oops. There we are. So once we get that through there, make sure to cinch it up as always. And that sort of stays by itself. If you want, you can use helping hands to hold it into place. Um, always a good idea to use the helping hands. They keep a lot of the strain relief off so you don't end up with bad or s disturbed solder joints. Um, and this is a lot of metal to heat up. So this might take a little bit. Um, if it helps, um, the hotter your soldering iron definitely helps. I wouldn't go above, uh, say, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in this case, it's just a long wait to get this large chunk of metal to heat up for us. Um, the other thing that helps, especially for things like this, if you have a replaceable tip on your soldering iron, um, go to the biggest tip you can possibly stand. That seems to help a lot. There we go. Now we're getting this solder to melt. Um, generally, you have to heat up the entire thing to the point where all of it can melt solder regardless of what you're trying to do. There we go. Nice big chunk of solder. And also, because it's so such a large mass of metal, it's going to take a little bit of time for it to cool down. Um, so I like to let it sit there for 10, 20 seconds while it's cooling down, maybe give it some air across it. We're good. OK. So from here, we know that we want to go from the positive side of the Deans. We want to go through the car horn to the drain of the MOSFET. So we know that we have the gate here, and that's going to be connected to the uh, Arduino. We have the drain here, and we want to solder a wire to that. Um, this is going to require a different wire, so let's do that wire first, and then we'll solder it to the car horn. So once again, we're going to make a little loop around the piece of wire. attach that to our drain. And let's put everything into the helping hands. Always again helps to cinch up. And get everything settled into our helping hands. And we can kind of leave stuff apart like this. I'm not trying to bunch everything together. Um, if you're trying to do this for any sort of stability, I would put it in sort one of our proto boards or something you can actually solder into. Um, this is just a quick and easy way to solder up a MOSFET, certainly not for reliability. 
So once again, we're going to get some solder onto this as soon as everything heats up. And just as a reminder, if you like to have to solder things into a board but are still uh, hooked on the, the, the solderless breadboard form factor, we have recently released a breadboard that allows you to maintain that form factor while soldering your boards for stability. I hear those are quite popular, actually. Um, cool trick I learned, or I heard with one of those, is you can take those, um, put it right over your breadboard, put your components in how you would do a breadboard, test it, and then solder everything into place. Forget where I heard that. I thought that one was pretty neat. All right. So we're back to making little loops here. Let's not pinch ourselves with this. And we are going to, once again, we're back to one of these giant metal lugs. So this takes a little bit of time. And if you can get, you notice how I'm trying to put the entirety of my tip across the metal, that transfers the most heat for us. And I, sometimes I like to feed it a little bit of solder that seems to help with the heat transfer. So you notice that it's balling up here. That's telling me that the solder or the tip of the wire is hot enough to melt the solder, but the metal around it, the metal from the car horn lug is not. So I need to have, I need to wait here a little bit longer until that starts to be able to melt solder. Um, this is usually you get into problems if you thought you had soldered it now and you pull off the iron, what's going to happen is the solder will just solidify around the wire and not actually make a connection to the uh, lug or the pin that you're trying to solder to. Now it's starting to melt the solder. It is just a slow process. And remember that cold joints can be probably the easiest point of failure on a kit that you've built. So if you have a problem with a kit that doesn't work the way it should, double check your solder joints and make sure that the connection is clean. Let that solidify. And you can always tell the liquid metal, when the solder is still liquid, it looks like T1000 from Terminator. It definitely looks like liquid metal. Um, very shiny. Um, I mean, you can move it around if you want, but that's a bad idea. When it solidifies, it'll turn kind of a dullish color, and that's a good sign that it is okay to move. All right. Or you can poke it with something to see if that works. Not the best idea. So we have our five wires. So once we're in this stage, we know that we need to connect the, this is our plus, we know that we need to connect the other minus to the source, so G, D, S, of the MOSFET. And we're just going to come around here, make another little hook, and connect that to our source. Um, and it's a good idea to keep the wires away from each other. Um, you don't want to run the risk of having them short. So use your helping hands where you can and cinch up your, your hooks or your loops with a set of needle nose pliers. And just very carefully heat that up and these should go a little bit more quickly. There we go. Um, I do want to make a note here that these are 22 gauge wires. Um, these solid core wires are rated for two to three amps, if I recall. Um, not enough for the eight amps of the full blast of the car horn. Um, but because we're only running it at 7.4 volts, the car horn, I measured it, only draws about two amps, so it should be okay. Um, there was an instance, Evan's already laughing at me, there was an instance where we tried to drive 12 volts through one of these car horns. Um, do you want to tell that story, Evan? Oh, sure. So recently at a local hackathon, uh, a number of our uh, staff were present to uh, offer some technical support, and we figured might as well participate while we're playing. So uh, one, of, one of our uh, crew decides to try and uh, set up a, a, uh, a timer buzzer with the, uh, with the car horn with only the scraps of, of parts that we had available with us. So it, it ended up being loading into a one of the laptop power supplies that we carry and some of the prototyping wire that we tend to include with the, the SparkFun Inventors kit. 
which, as Sean said, tends to rove around a 22 gauge. Now, when we finally got the system ready and working, it actually did work, but after about three quarters of a second, we started noticing smoking coming from the wires and it actually caught fire. We quickly cut power to uh, prevent any further uh, malady, but uh, it's definitely a, a wise precautionary tale to make sure that your wires can support the current that they're loading. Yeah, always look that up. You can find charts and stuff on the internet if you're looking to see how much your wires can do. Yeah, that was funny. If I remember, it also melted some of the insulation together of some of the wires. Oh, yes, and we actually had a solid short circuit with that. Oh, <laughs> fun. Okay, so we are done with this circuitry. We have the car horn hooked up through the MOSFET to the power connector. We've got these two going off to power our Arduino. So we'll put this aside for the second and we're gonna look at the mono amplifier. Um, I've taken the liberty of soldering the headers on. You can find lots of tutorials on how to quickly solder headers up. Um, these are just the standard breakaway 100 mil headers that you can find. What we need to do with this is solder it, or solder some wires from the mono amplifier to the speaker. Um, you notice that there is an out. We're gonna be using the out plus minus and we're going to the speakers. These happen to be labeled plus minus. Um, so first thing I want to do is actually add wires to the amplifier itself, and I'm just going to hold the mono amplifier in the helping hands, um, and one at a time add wires that go to the speaker. And because this isn't multiple wires on one terminal, I can happily do this one at a time. Um, once I've stuck it through there, make sure you've got enough sticking out the back, enough wire sticking out the back here. If I can turn that up so... There. Sort of see what's going on. Rest your tip across both the tip of the wire and the plated through hole pad. Once that heats, you should be able to create a nice Hershey Kiss style solder joint. Um, in the ideal situation, you want to make sure that you have a little bit of solder coming up through the uh, primary side of your board. So once that's done, we're going to go ahead and stick a second wire in here. Use the helping hands to clamp those or clamp those into place. And same exact thing. Apply the iron to both the tip of the wire and the pad, and let the solder solidify. Okay, so we have that. Those, little, those look good. Solder coming through the primary side. Um, good time to go ahead and clip these. You don't want these bumping into something and shorting. And now, we are going to go ahead and solder into the speaker. So remember how I said you want the plus? going into the plus of the speaker. And there's a little bitty mark on the speaker. You can see it here, um, at least on these speakers. If you happen to got, have gotten lucky sometime before Christmas, um, we had the larger 25 watt speakers in stock. They were not available when I was creating this. So unfortunately, I was not able to do the party button with the much better speakers. Um, I think they're supposed to be back in stock sometime mid-January. So if you're watching this at a later date, feel free to use the larger ones. Uh, you might need to use a different amplifier because I don't think this is powerful enough to supply those at 25 watts. Um, those, yeah, those would be a lot of fun to play with, but unfortunately I did not have them available for this build. Um, which is sad because the car horn vastly overpowers the speaker. So you hear the car horn go off and then a little bitty tinny speaker comes out and plays some music. The idea is there, and once you get the hang of this, you can try it with a larger speaker and a little bit more power. All right, that's the plus side of the speaker. Let's go to the minus side. Um, plus and minus doesn't really matter in speakers so much because they're just looking at differences in voltage, so as voltage goes up and down. Um, if I reverse these, you would hear the same thing. It only comes into effect when you are dealing with stereo sound. So if you have more than one speaker, you want them to be in phase or in sync with each other. So if you reversed one and not the other, um, there's a good chance the sound might cancel. And I'm getting this thing caught. There we are. So I'm going to cinch this. Oh, right. Speakers have magnets on them. 
it's catching my tool. There we are. Solder this last one on here. Let that wet. The solder will reflow and then solidify. There we go. Okay. So we've got all of our components here. Um, we have the Arduino and MP3 shield. Um, I've gone ahead and once again taken the liberty. I've put the uh, Arduino headers onto the MP3 shield and also put some uh, basic headers on here where we're going to attach the mono amplifier. Uh, that's just going to sit right on top of the Arduino. Um, in this case, I'm using SparkFun's breadboard, but any sort of Arduino, Uno, uh, Leonardo, any of those that have these standard headers should work for us. So that'll sit on there like that. And we want to hook up everything else. So what we're going to do, um, we are going to have our battery. We're not going to quite hook up our battery yet because we want to test our program and make sure everything works before we can go ahead with the car horn. But we know that this is our plus side coming out of the battery and we can always verify by double checking. Yes. We're going to want to use um, these male to female connectors for most of these. So I'm going to take my baggie here, put them out, and we're going to connect the plus side of the battery to V in of the Arduino. And keep in mind that we want to use VIN, not 5 volts, not 3.3 volts, because this is 7.4 volts. The Arduino is going to go ahead and regulate that for us. Um, if we try to plug it into something else, we might blow some stuff up. Um, and I think we've all sold out of the magic smoke putter back into thingy. Um, the mono amplifier. So we want to have the 5 volts come out of that. or coming out of the Arduino going into power plus of the mono amplifier. We want to have the A0. Ah, we're getting some adjustments on the, uh, the laptop here. That does have all my notes on it, so I need to see where these connections go, because uh, we don't want bad things to happen if I hook this up incorrectly. So we want to have the A0. And keep in mind, we're using the analog pins here um, the reason for that is because the MP3 shield took almost all but I think one of the digital pins um, for all of its purposes to talk to the SD card and play us music. So we're just going to switch to the analog pins for this use. Um, so A0, we're going to go to the plus on the big button. There we are. And this is why I'm using the solid core wire because it happens to attach quite nicely. We're going to be using a, I'm sorry, A1 coming out and going to normally open on the big button, like so. And then we want A2 to come out. And go to our gate on the MOSFET. It is now looking like a large mess of wires, which is probably a good thing. Um, we need to connect up the speakers. So this is when we're going to actually do our um, female to female connectors here. Um, we're just going to use a red, and, or I'm sorry, a blue and a green to go to the speaker. So we're going to go speaker minus to in, there should be another one, in minus. It's listed on the, speak, the mono amplifier. And then minus, or I'm sorry, speaker right. Um, keep in mind, we're going to flip to mono mode, so it doesn't matter if you're using left or right on the MP3 shield, to the mono amplifier plus. OK, now we've got to do a bunch of ground connections. So good time to remind you guys. Um, feel free to ask us questions. Post them in the comments section, uh, that little chat room thing you've got. Um, anything that's directed at me or Evan will be sent over to us. Um, so back to this, we've got We've connected up the speakers, we've got to do ground. So we have three grounds available on the Arduino. The first one we want to make sure we have going into the battery. The second one we want to make sure we've got going to the mono amplifier. It should be listed as ground. There's PWR and GND listed on here. There's a third pin 
but we're not going to be worried about that one too much. And then we should have one more ground. I'm going to use a green here. And we're going to go to, there should be one more ground on this side of the Arduino. Make sure I plug in the right one. And on the minus in the common of the big button. OK. Now, that has everything hooked up for us. Um, before we test this programming, I want to make you aware of one thing. We actually want to disconnect V in. Um, the reason for that is when we go to test the programming, because we still have it plugged into the uh, computer at this point, um, V in might try to draw way more than what USB can, can supply. It'll just bring the Arduino down. That means the horn's not going to fire until we plug in the battery. But let's unplug V in for now. We'll plug it back in when we go to test the horn. OK, let's switch over to Arduino and our programming. <clears throat> OK. So first thing I like to do is take a USB cable and plug it into your computer and plug it into the Arduino. Um, I always like, every time I'm using a new board, I like to test to make sure that I can program it with something um, such as like a blinky. Most Arduinos that you buy have some sort of LED on board that you can just do this basic test. So as soon as you plugged it in, your computer should auto enumerate it as something. So in this case, say COM8, which I'll go ahead and make sure that's selected. Uh, make sure you have selected Arduino Uno. If you're using the red board, for example, Arduino Uno. So with those, go to File, Example, and go into your Basics and Blink. Um, always a good one to test. I leave everything as the default and just say Upload. Um, that's going to go ahead and compile and upload it to the Arduino so that we can test this. Um, I like to test this because it makes sure I've got that connection made. Um, it looks like it's uploaded. If you twist it, you can see in the red board has a little bitty blue LED that will blink on and off about once a second. Good. That means this hardware is working. I know I can program it from the Arduino sketch. So now we want to go in and install some libraries. So what we want to do is go to github.com. We want to go to SparkFun. Lots of love for the GitHub over at SparkFun. And we want to go to Party Button. Um, I've created this. This should be public for everyone to see. Uh, feel free to go in here. Um, it is open source. You can mess around with it, put pull requests and whatnot. Um, but for the purposes of this, we're going to go into Libraries. Um, you'll see this big library thing here. Just say View Raw, and it's going to download a zip file for us and show that in the folder. Um, you can see I've already been playing with this. Um, just say Extract All, and just say Extract in Place. Um, that goes in and pulls this. I want to make a shout out to Bill Porter who wrote this library. This was not done and maintained by SparkFun. This was done by one of our customers. Um, thank you, Bill, for putting this together. Your library is fantastic. So we have that unzipped. We go into the library, and we want to copy SDFAT and SFE MP3 Shield. So both of those folders, you want to highlight, copy. You want to go wherever you have Arduino installed. So in Programs x86, Arduino, you go into Libraries and just paste them right there. So when we do that, keep in mind that we have just installed a library. We're going to need to shut down Arduino and reload it. We'll do that in a minute. But first, we've got to get some songs. So we need to take a micro SD card, um, which is going to fit into our MP3 shield. We're going to put that in something that'll read it. Uh, my laptop can read uh, SD cards. If your computer doesn't get one of these little readers, the ones that SparkFun sells comes with these USB readers. And put that into your laptop or computer. There we go. Uh, the computer, if you're using Windows, it'll come up and say, hey, I want to look at what's in your SD card. And you can say, OK, that's fine. <laughs> so go to where we downloaded the libraries. Um, back to there, you'll see this is where we were, where we copied these two libraries. Um, we want to use this one called Plugins. Go into the folder called Plugins, and we want to grab everything that is .053. These are driver files that gets loaded onto the SD card. When we boot up the MP3 shield, the MP3, she MP3 shield goes to the SD card, looks for drivers, actually copies all those binary files, and uses them to play MP3. 
Um, you can load them into the Arduino sketch somehow. I'm actually not entirely sure how that's done, but this is just the vastly easier way to do it. Go to your SD card, the root directory of that. You want to paste all those .053 files in there. And the next thing we want to do is find us some music. So wherever you have some music, find us a song. We're going to use a good old 90s dance song for this. So copy that. Go to the root directory of your uh, SD card. Paste that in. And once you're doing that, you're going to notice that it's uh, a lot of times if you're using like iTunes or Amazon or something like that, um, you have a kind of nasty file name. The MP3 Shield does not deal with nasty file names too well, so you want to name it something else. Um, in this case, I would say try to keep it simple. I'm just going to use track 000, 001. Um, you can call files or songs by name uh, based on the file name in the Arduino sketch. Um, we're just going to say, hey, play the first one. It still doesn't seem to like characters like spaces or dashes or things like that. So keep the file name simple. OK, go ahead and eject the SD card. Now's a good time to remove that. Take the SD card out and place it into your MP3 shield. Good, we have that loaded. Um, take your, if you've had to unplug your USB for your MP3 shield, you can plug that back in. We want to go to the GitHub, go to the main page of the GitHub for the party button, go into firmware, uh, party button, and you'll see the Arduino sketch for the party button. Um, we are not going to write line by line. That would take us most of the evening to do all of this. I mean, it's you know, maybe 100 lines of code. It's not that bad. But you just want to copy that, open up an Arduino sketch. Um, we're just going to paste that in. I'm going to go through what it does so I can explain it. But it is there for you to play with, hack with, um, make it do some fun things if you so desire, um, ask us questions about it and whatnot. So um, you, we have the sketch up here. And what we're going to want to do is I'm going to go down and start where the code is and walk you through some of this. Here we load in the spy drivers and the SD and MP3 shield drivers. Those let us do things like talk to the SD card. Um, we're going to be using the file allocation table, the FAT file system to uh, access files. Pull the song off. We're going to use the MP3 shield library to play the first song. We can increase, decrease volume, skip tracks, and whatnot. Um, we're going to have some global variables here. We instantiate an SD card object and an MP3 player object. That's how we interact with those in the code. Um, we want to define us some pins, so we're going to be using a spy pin. The chip select of the spy is pin 10. Um, Arduino is weird. Arduino makes you use pin 10 for chip select um, if you want to use hardware spy. Um, if you don't enable pin 10 as output, you cannot use hardware spy in Arduino. I don't know why that is. That is just part of Arduino. So the next thing is LED pin. This is what we've assigned earlier. A0 is LED. A1 is button. Um, the horn is A2. And we're going to have some states, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. Um, we fire up the serial port. So if you want to debug this and see what's going on in the background, you can. Not really important for this, though. Um, we define all of our pins as output except for the button pin. Um, notice how down here I say uh, pin mode, button pin, and we say input underscore pull up. So that enables the pin as an uh, input, but it also gives us that internal pull up that we were talking about so we didn't have to bring another 10K um, and solder that up as well, to another 10K resistor. So then we initialize the SD card. Uh, we put this in a while loop because sometimes the SD card just did not initialize. So we just literally keep trying until it initializes. Sits there, waits for half a second, tries again. Waits for half a second, tries again. Most of the time, this works on the first, first try. If not, you'll just sit there until the SD card initializes. So uh, we initialize the MP3 player shield, and then we set the mode to mono, so it doesn't matter if it's coming out of the left or right channel. And we set the volume to the maximum. Um, note here, if you're using the MP3 player shield, uh, that the volume function is backwards. So zero is your maximum volume. 255 is your minimum, so just pay attention to that if you're using this. Um, next, we go into the main loop. And this is a fairly simple state machine. So all that's going to happen in this case is uh, for the initial state, the button is just going to light up and wait for somebody to push it. When you push the button, it goes into the next state. It's only when you release it that it actually starts playing the song. So down here in case one, you'll see digital write horn pin high. That turns on the horn. During that time, it's loading up or queuing the first track on the SD card, 
And once that's done cueing and starts playing, that's when the horn turns off and the music starts playing. Um, it does take three to four seconds to actually cue up the song, so you get a nice blaring horn. Um, after that, while the song is playing, that goes into the third state where the LED just flashes on the button and it's waiting for somebody to push it. Once you push it, the song stops and when you release, the whole system resets so you can push it again for another party. Okay, so that covers all of the code. Let's go ahead and upload. Like I mentioned, make sure that VN is unplugged so we're not trying to drive the horn from the Arduino and we can just say upload. It takes a little bit to compile this. And tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. So we are compiling, and we're compiling, and we're compiling. Oh, nope, now we're uploading. Ah, light came on. We are good to try. So, light comes on. Let's see what happens. So remember, it takes a little bit to queue up the first song. And I don't hear any volume, do you? Huh. Now we're going to have to troubleshoot because nothing... Oh! You don't have any power coming out of you. That is interesting. This MP3 shield does not have any power going on. It looks like it's trying to play the song, but the, MP, the uh, mono amplifier does not have any power. So we get to debug this and see what's going on here. Uh, in plus, power and ground. I have this hooked up correctly. And there is no power going to the audio amplifier. I have a very, very low... Huh. Oh, that is interesting. So while Sean is troubleshooting, I just want to take another moment and remind you that uh, if you have any questions, feel free to co uh, post them in the comments section to your right. Um, if you'd like, Sean, we do have more for you. Ha! Okay, let's try this again. I can, I can hold it in place and it seems to be holding. I think I have a short going on here. Let's see what happens. Still not. I don't know. However, I have a backup plan. There is another speaker. So if you have your own speakers, you can also drive them with something else. Let's see if this works. So my backup plan is to bring your own speaker to this. Um, I am gonna have to troubleshoot this mono amplifier, but for the time being, I'm just going to go ahead and use this speaker. So this should hopefully fit in our box later. So as you can see, we've got this. We hit this. This comes out of the MP3 shield and goes to a bring your own speaker. All right. So we got that working. We want to put this into a box so we can actually have a mobile party button with us. Um, something the size of a shoe box should hopefully work for us. Um, let me just show you the basic layout of what we're going to be doing here. Let me take off my speaker. And we want to unplug this because we're going to be going... Oh, I completely forgot. I wanted to test with the car horn first. Before we do any of this, we need to make sure that the car horn circuit is working. Let's put this back into place. We're going to put the ground, and now we can connect the V in, and we can bring the car horn into play. All right. Yeah, this one might get a little loud. <laughs> and this is what I was talking about. Oh, it's trying to play. This is what I... <laughs> Case in point. So this is what I was talking about where it was dipping the voltage a little bit. Um, if you have bad solder connections or whatever it might be, this might come into play. And I saw this on my other one. A lot of times you can disconnect the battery and bring it back. 
Man, you are not being fun with me right now. So while Sean is troubleshooting that, we have a question from Tony DeCola, who asks, does the amp have a gain that you need to crank up? Does the amp have a gain? The, are, are they referring specifically to the mono amplifier the, on the, um, the, the amplifier for the, yes, for the speaker? OK. Um, there is a gain that is set in code. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, not that. That is the MP3 shield. Um, this is the mono amplifier. Uh, there is, but it's been pre-configured pre for, I believe, whatever maximum was. Um, it looks like there is a short somewhere on the board because when I was fiddling with the wires, the power LED was going off and on. So there is a short that needs to be, um, I need to take a look at and troubleshoot what's going on with that. So um, it look, there is a gain, but it's preset on the board itself. Man, that one is not working either. OK. <laughs> well, you can at least have a party horn button that goes on. So I'll show you how to put this into the box, and maybe we can figure it out along the way. All right. So how we're going to configure this thing is we want to take the horn, and we're going to place the horn on this side. We're going to screw that in. We're going to have the battery come in about here. And we're going to use zip ties to hold that into place. And we're going to use zip ties to hold the Arduino into place. And then we're going to put the button up top. Um, so I recommend unplugging the button for now so we can deal with that. Um, and, and then for me, we'll probably just lie this, my other speaker in here somewhere. Or if we can troubleshoot this in time, we'll show that. OK, Evan, do you have any more new stuff while we're doing this? As a matter of fact, Sean, I do. So in that spirit, the darkness room the, sorry, the DARPA Robotics Challenge took place, uh, the trials took place last month with 16 teams in attendance. Uh, many teams who were in attendance used the Atlas platform as built by recent Google acquisition, Boston Dynamics. The winner of the event was Team Shaft, another recent Google acquisition, with a total of 27 points. Now, the top eight teams will advance to the DARPA Robotics Challenge Finals, and the qualifying teams could receive a potential up to $1 million funding from the DARPA project itself. Now, other teams may be eligible to enter in the finals. However, they would have to secure their own funding. And from the department of sci-fi tech gone real, Panasonic has announced a mechanical heavy lifting suit that will go into mass production later this year. The projected target price for the suit is approximately 50,000, or excuse me, 500,000 yen, or which translates to a little bit less than $4,800 US. The target capacity for lifting uh, states that this vehicle will be able to lift up to 220 pounds it will be able to move at speeds of up to five miles an hour and transit gradients of up to ten degree uh, of up to ten degrees slope. Now, this seems to draw a, a lot of inspiration from the 1980s classic sci-fi horror Aliens, wherein Sigourney Weaver's Ripley used the, used such a device to jettison the Queen Alien. Speaking of aliens, Sean, how are you doing? Well, no, no aliens in this box, but that might explain for some of the reasons why the uh, mono amplifier is not working for me right now. Um, so what I've got going on is I've um, draw, drilled a hole in the side to attach the car horn. I'm going to use a zip tie to just kind of hold the battery into place. I'm going to go down one side and come back the other. There we are. And there we go. 
use some cutters to cut the zip ties so there's not f just flailing everywhere. And then we want to use, again, zip ties to hold the MP3 player. Actually, first thing we want to do is cut a small hole, mark that so we can get in with the USB later on if we so desire. And then we want to mark where we want to drill some holes for uh, zip ties. So we're just going to, I think we learned last time, always cut away from yourself with sharp objects, lest you want to stab yourself. Um, I'm just cutting a hole in the back here so we can get a, um, a mini USB cable to the Arduino if we want to reprogram it for later purposes. And just drilling some holes there so we can attach some zip ties. Um, I'm going to be using some of these thinner ones. Um, the larger ones don't quite seem to work with the um, Arduino holes, the ones that are meant for, say, 440 screws. Let's make sure I'm doing this the right way. I'm going to have to get underneath this box to do this. There we are. Put the Arduino through there. And we're going to come down through this side, like so. And this is just one way. If you've got screws available, you can also use screws to hold the Arduino in place. Um, zip ties are just fun and cheap and easy. Why not? There we go. And I'm just going to attach, since I can't flip the box over for you, unfortunately, because all this my stuff would fall out, I'm just going to attach the zip ties on the underside. There. Actually, that one should hold it pretty well. We are going to go ahead and cut these. Like so. So we don't have zip tie all over the place. And that should hold it in place for us while we put these down. OK. So we've got these here. Um, we can go ahead and connect the back. Oh, nope, I'm sorry. I want to put this in. So these are a little bit tricky. You have to twist this whole thing off. You notice this is where the LED is. Um, this, you can see, if you look in the middle here, you can actually see where the current limiting resistor is. Um, so based on that, we want to figure out where we want to put the button. Um, so I'm just going to mark around the side. Well, it's a terrible marking job. And that's the great thing about using a, a shoe box or one of our spark front red boxes as an enclosure is it's very forgiving. So if you don't have precise tooling, you can very easily cut sort of a, a makeshift hole and it'll fairly easily be concealed. Yes, absolutely. And the nice thing about working with cardboard is it's you can kind of eyeball stuff, so if you make it too small, too big, you can easily adjust it. Does fit, but I forgot to pull off my nut. There we go. Put that on. Attach that like that. And we can put this back on. There we go. So now we want to hook this back up. So we had a ground. So this is going to be the green wire coming out of here. That we want to go to the minus. We want to have, um, it was A0 going to our LED plus. And we want to have A1 going to our switch. And as Sean is rewiring, this highlights the importance of proper labeling of which pin goes to which button. Always a good idea. All right. Well, that's hooked up. 
Looks like we got a heartbeat on the underside. We do, we do. Um, I do need to get a speaker in here somehow. Will this fit? <laughs> I'm going to make this fit somehow. We're going to see this thing makeshift on the fly here. I'm going to cut a hole in the back. This is what I'm going to do. Oh, this is going to be fantastic, I promise. So I'm going to cut a hole to allow me to wire some of this. Let's see if this will work for us. And put, come on. Yeah, I need to cut that hole a little bit bigger. As we're coming through, we can take our speaker wire. Now the reason why I had to go a little bit larger with the speaker hole is because the, the jack actually sits about a quarter of an inch back from the enclosure wall. So we need to be able to get this, uh, some of the strain relief on the end of the speaker into the box as well, not just the jack. Correct. And I'm just going to cut another hole back here of similar size so we can just thread the whole slew of cable through. There we go. We'll make it happen. Engineering in progress. Make sure this is still on. Does everything fit, mostly? One thing I forgot to do is this should close, mostly. Um, what you're going to find is that um, you're not going to be able to close uh, this flap of it because we've drilled a hole on the side here where the car horn is. So I'm just going to guess about where we need to cut out for this side. Yeah. Remember to cut away from you and I'm just cutting a notch into this flap so hopefully it'll go around the car horn nut there. Like Evan is reminding me, cut away from you. Never want to cut towards you. Right. Uh, let's make sure our stuff is connected. Hopefully nothing blows up. All right, we've got lights. We've got wire sticking out of the back. It's got to be good. There we go. <laughs> Well, it seems that there's something going on with the car horn itself. Maybe there was something wrong with the wiring connection. Um, I can do the magic pie trick here. Yeah, unfortunately that does not, see it seems to blow once and then that's about it. Um, nothing seems to be smoking or getting hot. That's always a good sign. Well, let's see what happens. If I watch, no, doesn't seem to be bringing down the MP3 shield. Um, I can do the pie out of the oven here and show you what's going on with the one that I know does actually work for us. Evan, you want to take a look there? So, we've got the internals of this that's wired up the exact same way. Um, the car horn's coming through the MOSFET here. Um, that's being powered by the battery like so. Um, MP3 shield going up to the giant button. Um, and then you notice I cut a hole out in the front here um, the one thing to keep in mind is if you're doing the speaker out of the front is that you'll need to cut a hole in the front so that you can actually let the sound come out and not sound too muffled. There, much better. Okay. So, that wraps it up. We can, did you just hurt yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> Might have killed the board, though. You realize your battery's still plugged in, right? Yep. OK, cool. I'm trying to get a live voltage test. We are seeing tech support in action.
So Evan, what are you doing? I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> no, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get a uh, voltage reading off of the uh, horn when it's when it's actually sounding when the button is pressed. And unfortunately, I don't have the hands to actually uh, get a reliable reading. So that is something that I will have to look at to figure out. Here, send it to tech support. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I can take a look real quick. Uh, let's go to 20 volts to tell, tell us. And let me know if you actually need something held. Because yeah, really I mean, hard to do things with three hands. so we can see this in action. So we've got a minus coming out of here, and the other side of the car horn, uh, that's plus. So that's going to be, that'll show us a voltage. Yeah. 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 Can you reach under there and hit the button? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, you see it drop as the switch is closed, but then that's about it. No, this is going to take some more finagling to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, there, there's a good chance there might be a short on some of these joints. I just don't see it. Um, but yes, but you saw it working. That's the idea. Um, like I said, the using the battery is a little bit iffy. Um, I would recommend just going ahead with, like, say, the speaker if you're using something trying to get a party button, or if you have some sort of external speaker where you can drive your own amplifier from. Um, whether it's something you can bring yourself, computer speakers, um, you know those are going to work for you, um, and those give you a lot more power. Um, we don't have the 25 watt speakers available right now. They'll hopefully be back in stock. Um, I would love to do a build with something like that so you can actually get a lot of music going for you. Evan? So there you have it. Uh, we have a live build attempt and the actual uh, working product. Um, here we have the quad rotor that we tore apart and have subsequently reassembled. So uh, thanks for joining us and uh, hope you'll be back for next time. I'm Evan. I'm Sean. And this has been Spark Fun Live. Thank you very much. Four seconds. No. We're so <laughs>